a woman once reflected on her marriage and she said, I really hoped that I would have a storybook mess, a marriage and a fairy tale marriage and I think I've accomplished it. I feel like Snow White. I just only want to know how in the world I ended up with Dopey. <laughs> a boy once asked his dad, Dad, is it true in ancient China and other cultures that a man didn't know his wife until after they were married? And his dad responded, that happens everywhere, son. Absolutely everywhere. Well, sometimes it's good to have a laugh, even at a bad joke, if you will. But sometimes it's good to have a laugh at these challenging subjects in life. But we all know that marriage is a very serious subject. When the marriage relationship is thriving, there is great joy. Families flourish and our communities, our very communities in which we live, they are strengthened. When marriage is struggling and when marriage is on the rocks, when marriage experiences the thunder of being torn asunder, the pain is palpable. And the threads that hold family life, and yes, even community life, the threads that hold these together are extremely fragile. Well, today we continue our series looking at the Sermon on the Mount. And this series is called Life in the Other Direction. Uh, what it looks like to live the way that Jesus called us to live, even in the face of a culture that might be going in the other direction. And we see that Jesus turns to the subject of marriage and really he turns to the subject of divorce. We've seen all throughout this series that Jesus didn't hesitate at all to, to tackle the messy areas of life and just to get right down into the nitty gritty. And I'm so glad that we follow a Lord who moved into the neighborhood of human existence and was willing to cast God's vision for what it means for us to thrive and to flourish. One of our core values here at downtown is that we seek and we strive. We're not perfect, okay? But we seek and strive to be authentically biblical. We believe that the teaching of God's word should impact all walks of life. And our call as disciples of Jesus is to align our lives to scripture. It is not to try to align scripture to our lives, but to align our lives to the truth of Jesus as revealed in scripture. We are Bible-based. We are Bible-based, but we do not believe in Bible whipping. Let me say that again. We are Bible-based, but we don't practice Bible whipping. Bible whipping is when you take the Bible and just bang somebody over the head with it over and over and over. When it comes to marriage and specifically divorce, there have been people who have been Bible whipped on this issue. They've gone through the trauma and the pain of divorce. And then in some form or another, they have been made to feel like second-class citizens in the church. I shudder to wonder how many people have quit the church of Jesus Christ because the church of Jesus Christ quit them when they needed the church the most. You can say that about a whole host of issues in the Sermon on the Mount, not just this one. The same Bible that holds marriage as sacred and forever is the same Bible that holds out grace and pardon for those who fall short of God's standard. And I know some of you have experienced the pain of divorce, either directly or indirectly. In my family, I grew up with grandparents who were divorced. I saw firsthand the pain that it cost my mother, even as she got older, the pain that that divorce caused her and the hard feelings that my grandparents had for each other all the way until they died. I've seen that kind of pain. Since then, I've had close family members go through divorce. I have had friends and yes, I've had colleagues in the ministry who have gone through the pain of divorce. If you've gone through it, you know. I don't need to tell you. You know it is heart-wrenching. And if you've experienced the pain of divorce directly, my heart goes out to you. And I want you to know that I've been praying for you as I prepared for this message this morning. And I have a special word for you at the end of our teaching time. So let me invite you to take out your teaching notes if you find taking notes helpful. And while you're doing so, I want to, want to once again acknowledge uh, the work of scholars and pastors on this issue. I've listed uh, most of them in the bulletin for you. Jesus 
in the Sermon on the Mount, two short verses on the subject of divorce, found in Matthew chapter 5, verses 31 through 32. Matthew chapter 5, verses 31 through 32, reads like this. It has been said, anyone who divorces his wife must give her a certificate of divorce. But I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality, makes her the victim of adultery, and anyone who marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Let's stand for our benediction. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> you cut, the knife, cut the air in the room, or whatever you call it, with a knife. Uh, let's look at the question. Let's look at Jesus' response, and let's look at reality and our response. Okay, so the question, Jesus' response and reality or and our response. The question. The question is not included in this text. It's somewhat implied. But later it is in Matthew chapter 19 when the religious establishment of the day came to Jesus and asked essentially my paraphrase, when is it okay? <laughs> when is it okay in the eyes of God to sever the marriage covenant, the marriage promise, and when is it okay to get a divorce? And can a man give his wife a divorce for any and every reason? That's the question being posed and asked to Jesus. Well, the Mosaic law that Jesus stated in verse 31 came from Deuteronomy 24, 1 through 4, which served as the Torah's basic guide on this subject of divorce. If a Jewish man wanted to get a divorce because his wife had become indecent, that's an operative word there, indecent to him, then he must give her a written certificate of divorce. He can't just throw her out. And this certificate had to be witnessed by two persons and it had to be signed by the husband. In other words, there had to be some framework, if you will, of due process for this woman. Now, the written certificate of divorce was actually an upgrade in the protection of women in that culture. In other words, a man had to certify that a woman was legally free to either marry again or return to her father. He just couldn't come home one day in a bad mood, if you will. So it was actually somewhat of an upgrade. Well, as most issues are, regardless of the century, there were a couple of different interpretations of what this meant. And there were two schools that emerged on this question of when divorce is permissible. And the debate focused on the word indecent. What does it mean if a man finds a woman indecent to him? Well, the conservative school of thought, known as the Shammai, said that indecently meant adultery. And it only meant adultery. That the only reason a man could give his wife a certificate of divorce is that if she broke the covenant of marriage through committing adultery. The more permissive school, known as the Hillel School, interpreted indecency in the widest possible manner. If a woman ruined dinner or if she spoke poorly about his parents in public, you know, the whole in-law thing. Even if he found a woman he considered more beautiful, then he could round up his two witnesses, Mutt and Jeff we'll call them, sign the certificate and the marriage would be over. Guess which school prevailed? Even among the religious establishment, the more liberal, permissive school prevailed. And that's why Jesus brought up and tackled this issue in the Sermon on the Mount. Now, one more word before we move to Jesus' response. You will notice, and I've been very intentional about trying to, to hold to the translation of Scripture, but you'll notice that the language is very male-dominated when we're talking about this issue of divorce. Anyone who divorces his wife, he must give her a certificate. A divorce back then could only be by the will of the husband. There were a few cases in which a woman could ask for a divorce, but it still had to be granted by the husband. It was an overwhelmingly male-dominated society. And divorce was absolutely devastating. It was devastating for a woman. And Jesus is coming here and he is protecting women in this statement. For example, when a woman was divorced back then, there were only about three options that she would have in life going forward. 
One is she may be able to return to live with her father. But even back then, it wouldn't be a guarantee that her father would take her back because she would have been considered unworthy or tainted to possibly even marry again. We all know that there are places in the world today where attitudes like this still hold toward women. I remember watching the news once and a correspondent from the war in Iraq several years ago was talking about this Iraqi woman who had been captured by a militia. And the militia actually called the woman's father and said, do you want her back? And then her father said, tell me, has she been raped? And the militia said, yes, she's been raped. And he said, no, go ahead and kill her. That was 21st century. Imagine what it would have been like in the first century had a woman been turned out by a man. Another option a woman might have would be to turn to prostitution only to survive. And then another option would be to try to remarry. If she did, she would often be treated as damaged goods. So this is a great moral question that came before Jesus. Can a man turn out his wife for any and every reason? Can a man turn out his wife for any reason at all? So what did Jesus say? Well, turn over to Matthew chapter 19, verses 4 through 9. And let's read what he said when he was posed this question by the religious establishment of his day. Matthew chapter 19, 4 through 9, and Jesus' response. Haven't you read, he replied, that at the beginning the Creator made them male and female and said, for this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh... So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Why then, they asked, did Moses command that a man give his wife a certificate of divorce and send her away? Jesus replied, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives because your hearts were hard. But it was not this way from the beginning. I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another woman commits adultery. So let's look at Jesus' response at a closer level. Notice he didn't get into the weeds of all their legal definitions of divorce. But the thrust of his answer was to remind them of God's vision for what covenant marriage is like between a man and a woman. We talked about the nature of covenant relationships last week. If you weren't here, I encourage you to go online and listen to that. We went over it in quite detail. Let me just detail. Let me just say this for now. A covenant relationship is a relationship in which the vows and the promise that a couple make to each other, that covenant covenant relationship, the vows and the promise are even more important than individual feelings. And we describe the difference between a covenant relationship and a consumer or contractual relationship. In a consumer or contractual relationship, as 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 long as you're meeting my needs, I'm going to stick with you. I gave the example of our our copier in the copier room. You know, as as soon as that copier stops meeting our needs, it's gone, right? And that's good for machines. It's not good for relationships. And so covenant marriage is one where the vow and the covenant is even more important than the whims of my feelings. Notice also here in his answer that Jesus goes all the way back to Genesis chapter 2. He goes all the way back. He said, your hearts have been hardened And they've been hardened because of sin. Genesis chapter 3. But he goes back to Genesis chapter 2. Before sin entered the world. And he describes that marriage is a wonderful and a mystical union between a man and a woman and God. And when a man and woman enter the covenant marriage, they become as one. As one. So he goes back and he establishes God's vision for marriage. Now, this oneness goes beyond physical intimacy. The physical intimacy is like a sacrament. It's an out, it is an outward symbol of the deeper intimacy of the soul. And this intimacy is so deep. And it is so powerful that it makes a man and a woman. Think about this for a moment. A man and a woman who were previously unrelated it makes that relationship between a husband and a wife even deeper and stronger 
than the blood relationship between a parent and a child. That's what happens when God knits a couple together in covenant marriage. He knits their souls together. It is a union knit together by the hand of God. And it's so powerful when this union is ripped apart. It is so powerful when it is broken. It is painful. And this pain ripples through generation to generation. It's interesting. In the time of Jesus, daughters were starting to say, I don't want to get married. I don't want to get married. If a man can turn me out for all reasons like that and expose me to this socioeconomic hardship by leaving my father's house, I don't want to get married in a dynamic like that, in a culture like that. And it's interesting, survey after survey after survey after survey of young adults in our culture today are saying, I don't want to get married. I've seen the hardship. I've seen the pain of divorce. This ripping apart of the marriage covenant is so painful that it causes generations of pain. Let me give you a, 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 another analogy. Let's say, it's, it's an ugly analogy, okay? Let me just state that from the beginning. Let's say I'm out uh, running on the GW Parkway. And if you see me running, that enough is an ugly analogy. But let's say I'm listening to a Nats game and I get distracted and I trip and I fall. And when I fall, I stick my hands out like this to break my fall. And it just rips the flesh off of both palms. And when I get up, for some reason, I take my palms and I put them together just like that. And I don't take them apart. Now that's painful enough. When you do that, nerves and nerves. But then let's say I leave my hands together. And I just leave them together. And together for hours, hours and days. And the flesh grows together. And then somebody comes along and they say, you look like an idiot walking around like that. Boom. How painful would that be? The ripping apart of the soul union between a marriage and wife is infinitely more painful than that could ever be. And if you've experienced the thunder of asunder, you know that's true. You know that's true. So this is why Jesus said, if you divorce a woman for any frivolous reason, then you may think you're divorced in the eyes of God, but God has not released you from that marriage covenant. And additional marriages and relationships compound the situation. But we must notice. We must notice that Jesus did not forbid divorce absolutely, did he? He did not forbid divorce absolutely. He says the exception is the case of marital unfaithfulness. He allows a divorce as an exception because the sin of unfaithfulness, sexual immorality, has entered the relationship and violated the sacred covenant of marriage. Now, it's interesting, the actual word for sexual immorality in the Greek is not typically the same word that's used for the word adultery. It's the Greek word pornea, which is actually different than the one used for adultery. And it includes a broader definition of sexual immorality that we typically, that, than we typically associate with adultery. It includes abuse or pedophilia or other forms. St. Paul also wrote that divorce is permissible in the case of desertion by an unbelieving spouse. And I have understood and interpreted desertion to also include abuse or that abuse is a form of desertion. Desertion and sexual unfaithfulness violate the marriage covenant of intimacy and the marriage covenant of allegiance. And there are those who have wondered if abandonment of any kind, the abandonment through a life ripped apart through addiction or other forms of that kind of abandonment, our Lord may also consider biblical, if you will, permission. Yet while divorce is permitted, we need to know that Jesus didn't say, I require you to divorce, did he? While divorce is permitted in some cases, biblically, it's not required. I've known of marriages that have been reconciled, repaired, and restored 
after adultery has been committed. I've heard of marriages that have been even saved after a season of abandonment. Jesus doubled down, if you will, on the importance of the covenant of marriage in his teaching. So what do we do? What do we do with all this? Let's talk about reality and our response. Reality in light of Scripture and our response. The reality is that people get divorced for reasons other than what is stated in the Bible. For many different reasons. Maybe they got into a, a marriage that they didn't thought through the reality of that. Maybe they got into a marriage where they weren't even thinking about the biblical vision for marriage at all. There are many different reasons that people get divorced other than the reasons that Jesus gives here and Paul gives. And of course, we know today that there are women who initiate divorce just like men do. That's reality. So how do we respond? Well, let me say this. If you have fallen short of God's vision for marriage and that you have initiated divorce for reasons other than described in the Bible, I encourage you to confess your sin before God. Ask him for his forgiveness and ask him for healing. Divorce is not the unpardonable sin. It is not. God will forgive you and God will pour his mercy and his grace all over you. Reconciliation with God is critical for healing and being reconciled to others. If you have not remarried and your ex has not remarried, I encourage you, if possible, to prayerfully consider a path toward reconciliation if your ex is open and guided by a trained counselor. I have known of marriages that have been reconciled after all the legal maneuverings said they were over. Now we know those situations are rare, but our God is in the business of rare and remote possibilities. Having said that, if it is over, and you know it's over, and through the process of divorce, you exhausted all the possibilities of reconciliation, like many of you did if you've been divorced, I'm sure, let it go. Let it go. I'm not going to sing Frozen. <laughs> let it go. Don't let the bitterness and anger from a past divorce rule and ruin your life. Don't let it. Our Lord doesn't want that to happen. Our Lord doesn't want you to carry that around. You can't really see it, but right under my eye here, I have a scar from hitting the rim when I slam dunked a basketball 25 years ago. No, I was playing basketball, but I caught an elbow oh, right on the cheekbone. Didn't hurt at all. But it opened up a cut and I started bleeding and I had to go to Rockingham Memorial Hospital in Harrisonburg when I was at JMU. And, and I'll never forget, I can see the elbow coming my way from my friend. I can see the blood pouring. I can see the doctor cleaning it up and stitching it. I can see all that. And I'm left with a small little scar right there. Small. But I'm not left with the pain anymore. I've got the scar, but I don't have the pain. But what if for the last 25 years, from the day the doctor stitched it, I started digging at the stitch and digging at the stitch and just scratching it and scratching it and scratching it and digging it and digging it and scratching it and scratching it, digging it, scratching it. It would have never healed. It would have never scarred and healed so I could play basketball again and move on. Well, it's the same way about a past relationship, no matter why it ended. If you keep digging at it after it's over, it won't heal. And that's just not for marriage relationships. That's any relationship. It won't heal. And you won't be able to move on to flourish the way the Lord wants you to flourish in your life. God wants to heal your deepest hurts in this area and in others. And he can heal the hurt and the pain and the disappointment, and you can begin again. But you have to fall into his grace, and you have to let it go.
And if you have divorced and remarried, his healing is a critical part of your new marriage being healthy and successful. If you're here today and your marriage is struggling, if it's on the rocks, if you feel like your marriage is in a desert, I want to encourage you to dig deep. I want to encourage you to hang in there. And I want to be clear. I'm not saying hang in there if you're in an abusive relationship. I'm not saying hang in there and be a doormat. I'm talking about the typical tensions and struggles of marriage. If your marriage is struggling, get help. See me. I can help you get the help you need. God's standard for marriage is high. So high that when some heard Jesus' answer, they thought it might be just a little bit easier to stay single than to get married. His standard for marriage is high. But the very same God who holds the standard of the marriage covenant high is the same God who will give you strength. The same God who will give you healing so that you can thrive, so that you can experience the joy in obedience, and so that you can have hope for the future. When it comes to this issue, I have two dreams for DBC. One is that we would be a place where we would extend our arms to all and to say, come as you are. Come as you are. My dream is that we would walk with folks who have experienced pain and that we are a source of healing and that we are a source of hope. And I believe that we are that kind of church. Unconditional love can be found here. And one of the most powerful ways we can do this is help folks who have experienced the pain of divorce to recover. That's one dream. The other dream is I would pray that with equal courage and tenacity that we will hold high God's vision for marriage. That we will invest deeply in the renewal and strengthening of marriages in our church and in our community, that God would actually use us, regardless of our background on this area, that God would use us to help our neighbors stay married for life. I'm not sure what all that looks like, but I believe as we pursue the heart of God together, that we can see marriages in our church and in our community. We can see marriages and families thrive. I want to end a little bit differently today. Um, we're going to sing a song to close our service, but I ask you to hang on to your communication card. And this is, this is a day where I'm going to invite you, because we really like these things because it's how we get to know you. But this is a day when I'm going to invite you to take this with you if you need to. Just take it with you. You can tell us how to get in contact with you another week. But you'll look on the back. There's a couple of different ways that you can respond, Okay. So one is that you can pray daily. You can respond today by praying daily for your marriage and for the marriage of your friends and loved ones. You can join a prayer effort to do this. You can purchase and read a book there that I've suggested about marriage that will strengthen your marriage. You can make the commitment today to seek help from a counselor. You can make the commitment today to recommit your marriage to God. And you can make the commitment today or respond by walking in the hope and the healing of God's grace. You know how you need to respond. So I encourage you to circle one, two, or if you need to circle all five, circle all five. Fold it up, put it in your pocket or your purse, and take it with you. Put this on the bathroom mirror somewhere, somewhere in the car, somewhere. And remember the response, the commitment that you're making today for your marriage, or to pray for the marriage of others if you're single. Remember the commitment you're making today by God's grace, okay? Well, I invite you to join me in prayer, and then we'll sing to close our service. Let's pray together. Lord God, we thank you for the way that you continue to come to us through your word. And Lord, we read these words from Jesus, and we realize that as he offers these words, they're words of healing, that they're words of mercy, that they're words of grace. That Lord, when he uttered these words, he was lifting up and caring for 
those who were just turned out and cast out in his day. Lord, I pray today that we would experience in all forms healing in this area of marriage if that's what we need, oh God. God, where there's the pain of divorce and somebody's been just holding on to it and not letting go, I pray, oh God, that you would work just healing in this life with grace and that you would give liberation and freedom, Lord, so that a healthy new beginning can occur. Lord, where there's hurt in a marriage today and a marriage that is teetering and a marriage that is struggling, I pray for healing. Lord, I pray for a new spirit of love and grace and commitment to that marriage. Father, where there is a healthy and strong and vital union, I pray, oh God, that you would continue to give grace for this marriage. And Lord, that you would lead us as a congregation, that we would be a place where people can come when there's hurt, that we would be a place that would hold high your vision for marriage and for family. That we would be a place that seeks to change our community and the families in it. Lord, we love you. We need your grace. We thank you for meeting us where we are. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, Dave's going to lead us in our closing song, and I'll have a final prayer after that. But I want to invite you, if you would like to share a commitment today, that uh, Crystal will be up here at the cross if you'd like to come and, and share a commitment with her and just talk about either this subject or, or if you want to come and be a part of our congregation, uh, she'll meet you there and receive you. Let's stand together as we sing.